Marx and Engels were very much the product of their times. The times were that Europe was emerging from a period that we refer to as the medieval period of European history into the modern period. And the 19th century in particular um, was an age of new discovery and new science. While I have briefly looked at uh, the Renaissance in the previous episode, and we will cover other things such as the scientific revolution and philosophical revolutions through the work of Marx and Engels. In this particular episode, I want to look at a very famous essay written by Frederick Engels titled The Part Played by Labour in the Transition from Ape to Man. It was authored in 1876. Now, at the time that Marx and Engels were writing, another very influential figure is the uh, person who wrote uh, Origin of the Species, that's Charles Darwin. Darwin for the first time demonstrated how all the diversity that we see in the world is the outcome of a single source um, evolving over time, a single source of life evolving and diversifying over time. And therefore that uh, each species of life was in some way uh, sometimes more distantly and sometimes more closely related to each other species in the entire animal kingdom, not just in the animal kingdom, in fact, in the entire species of life as a whole. And uh, Marx and Engels in particular were very excited by, uh, by the publication of Origins of the Species by Charles Darwin. Not necessarily so much so because they thought that Darwin's discovery that is evolution by natural selection dealt a big blow to theology, which in and of itself was true. But for Marx and Engels, I mean, from their point of view, they had thought that uh, theology had pretty much already been dealt a pretty severe blow, in particular in Germany, uh, where there was significant criticism about, uh, um, about, uh, about theology, that, where it had been subjected to quite a bit of criticism from the period of Kant and onwards, uh, Newton, uh, Kant, and then uh, Fichte and Hegel, etc., etc. So in one very famous essay uh, writing on Hegel, um, Marx and Engels remarked that the criticism of religion is complete. And that was something that they had said before Darwin wrote his book, The Origins of the Species. But what Marx and Engels were really excited about in The Origin of the Species was what they said was a major blow to teleology. This they wrote down very explicitly. They said that Darwin's discovery had shown that nature was not in any way, shape or form teleological. And this is very significant, that it was evolving without a necessarily end goal in mind, without a necessary plan. It was not doing so in accordance with any plan at all. And that it wasn't a fixed system, but rather that it, was a, it wasn't a metaphysical system, to use their language. But rather that uh, nature was in a constant source of dialectical change and evolution. So what they felt Darwin had discovered in The Origin of the Species was the dialectical movement of the evolution of life itself. But they always felt that one very important component was missing in the uh, framework that Darwin had created. While Darwin was talking not just about the evolution of man, Darwin was talking about the evolution of all species through this process that he termed natural selection. Marx and Engels, of course, were much more concerned about the evolution of man. And in this, they felt Darwin had neglected to add one very important component, which is the part played by labor, the part played by the activity of production in how uh, mankind itself evolved. So political economy, they say, was, has already acknowledged that labor is the source of all wealth. But what political economy also needs, or what we also need to acknowledge, is that labor is also the prime basic condition for all human existence. We cannot exist unless we work and create the necessities of life. We know this. We know this from political economy. But what is very, very important is that in the process and in the act of doing some work, in the process of labor, we are on the one hand creating that which is external to us, you know, let's say we are uh, planting crop or whatever. But on the other hand, we are also creating ourselves in the sense that we are learning to do a certain thing, to, to, to undertake a certain skill. And the way in which that is changing 
our minds and our bodies is something that political economy and even Charles Darwin perhaps has neglected. So not only is it the case that through labor we meet the conditions of our existence, not only is it the case that labor is a source of all wealth, but it is also the case, Marx and Engels argue in this particular essay, that labor created humanity itself, labor created man itself. Engels goes back to the tertiary period of evolution and talks about the Australopithecus afarensis, shortly known as Lucy. Now this is a fossil that was found in Ethiopia that is 3.2 million years old. And uh, what scientists were able to discover about this fossil, which, we've, which they term Lucy, the sort of first proto-human you could say is that this proto-human was completely covered with hair they had beards they had pointy ears and they lived in bands in trees they did walk upright by this particular point in time and these apes in particular Engels writes began to lose the habit of using their hands to walk and adopted a more and more erect posture this he says was the decisive step in the transition from ape to man I don't know if you've had the opportunity to look at this incredibly wonderful work by Peter Watson where he talks of it's it's a work called ideas and he talks about all the great ideas that really have led to the evolution the the mental evolution of man one of the key ideas is the idea that we should not be walking on all fours but that we should be walking just on two legs when the human animal began to walk on two legs and freed up two of its limbs for other things, that's when its mental development really took, uh, you know, uh, really exploded. Because once humanity begins to work with the hand, once man begins to work with the hand, the stimulation that the brain receives as a consequence of manipulating objects with the hand is absolutely phenomenal. And the mind develops incredibly quickly. So we have always spoken as historians or scholars about the evolution of the mind, but we have never really explored in any great detail, says Engels, the development of the hand. The key factor about the human hand is that, he says, the number and general arrangement of the bones and muscles are the same in both hands, but the hand of the lower savage, and he doesn't mean this pejoratively, this term, can perform hundreds of operations that no simian hand can imitate. No simian hand has ever fashioned even the crudest stone knife. By simian hand here, he means the hand of apes. They have never managed to do the incredible things that human, the human animal has managed to do, such as carving a stone knife. How did this happen? Well, flint was first fashioned into a knife. Flint knives can be found that are 1.7 million years old. Thus, Engel says, the hand is not only the organ of labor, it is also the product of labor. It is not only that man performs labor with the hand, but that as man performs and by man here I mean uh, it in the gender neutral terms, but as humanity performs labor, it changes the way in which our muscles are able to move. It produces a new and more um, dexterous hand only by labor, only by adaption to ever new operations through the inheritance of muscles, ligaments and over longer periods of time, bones that had undergone special development and the ever renewed employment of this inherited finesse in new and more and more complicated operations have given the human hand the high degree of perfection required to conjure into being the pictures of Raphael, the statues of Thorwell the music of Paganini. This, uh, to quote Engels, is what he says. So, and in fact, uh, the reason why he talks about Niccolo Paganini is because Paganini had exceptionally long fingers. He had such, such, a, such big hands and such long fingers that he was able to, on the violin, play three octaves simultaneously across four strings. Moreover, Engels tells us that man is a social animal. The hand 
never existed alone. There is a law of correlation of growth. Changes in certain forms involve changes in the form of other parts of the body. If I begin to use my hand a lot, it will obviously have an impact on my forearm. The impact on my forearm has an impact on my mind because it is through my nervous system, after all, that I'm controlling the hand, I'm controlling my forearm. So every time I begin to do things with my hand that are more and more difficult, more and more dexterous, if I pick up and learn to play an instrument, for example, that is, uh, those operations are being undertaken by my brain, by my mind. And my mind is also becoming much more agile and learning as a consequence of the actions of my hand. Some people call this, some psychologists call this muscular memory. Call it what you like, but the point nonetheless is that when you work with your hand, you develop the mind. So the use of the hand led to social labor and the need to communicate. Uh, when ancient men began to work together, when they had to lift logs together, when they had to move stones together, when they had to hunt together, the fact that they had to work together meant that they had to communicate. And in the process of working together, they developed language. So language also is very deeply connected, say Marx and Engels, to the process of labor. Engels writes, the dog and the horse, by association with man, have developed such a good ear for articulate speech that they easily learn to understand any language within their range of concept. And you can see this in various videos on YouTube that um, not only will parrots be able to understand and then reproduce human speech, but dogs will be able to understand human speech and some dogs are able to even reproduce human speech. It is absolutely incredible. And it's not so much that they're just reproducing the sounds. It is much more that they are grasping the actual concepts themselves. Engels continues, labor and then with it speech. These were the two most essential stimuli under the influence of which the brain of the ape gradually changed into that of man. Hand in hand with the development of the brain when the development of its most immediate instruments, the senses. So when I think about music, when I think about culinary skills, when I think about Marvish, my wife, taking such a strong interest in food and the way it smells, when I think about how humanity has a particular taste, how the prophet, for example, peace be upon him, uh, really enjoyed different smells. He had an aesthetic taste for, for scents. These, all these aesthetic senses continuously develop through labor, through the stimulation of the senses, through uh, the, the, the activity of the mind through the body. Um, there's also a wonderful book by Terry Eagleton where he talks about Marxism in relation to the body. And he says that Marxism is a very corporeal, materialistic philosophy, not just in the more abstract uh, epistemological uh, um, sense, but in the very real sense, in this sense, that man's uh, humanity's brain, humanity's mind is really shaped through the activity of their being, of their body itself. So through activity and specifically through labor, Engels writes uh, that the mind develops increasing clarity of consciousness, power of abstraction and of conclusion. What is the power of abstraction? What does that mean exactly? That we can think about concepts without necessarily, um, well, first and foremost, looking at them. That's one level of abstraction. So I can think about a person without necessarily seeing them in front of me in the flesh and blood. But also, more importantly, I can think about not just a person, but about personhood, about pers about people about humanity as an abstraction or about life as an abstraction. So the higher the level of abstraction that man can reach and the more complex the forms of abstraction that one can reach and conclusions that one can draw in the abstract, the higher Marx and Engels consider our cognitive abilities to be. Finally, we see, they say, the development of society. Now, what is society and how do Marx and Engels differentiate society from animal existence? They refer to animal existence as predatory economy, an economy in which animals are predators with respect to other animals or they eat plants, etc., etc., but they are not involved or engaged, at least not consciously, in the process of production. So the predatory economy of animals leads to the gradual transformation of species 
Unlike the hunter, the wolf does not spear the doe, which would provide it with the young the next year, says Engels. The goats in Greece that eat away the young bushes before they grow to maturity have eaten the mountains of the country entirely, says Engels. So they're not conscious of the fact that they must save you know, animals in order for animals to reproduce so that they can continuously feed. They, they're not conscious animals of, of the fact that they can't eat all the grass, they have to leave some grass, they have to leave some plants so that plants can regrow, etc. for next season. They are not conscious of this. They are mainly predators and if they continue, as long as their stomachs are hungry, they will continue to eat regardless of the environmental consequences. Although the degradation that animals have caused the environment is far less than the degradation human beings have caused the environment. But human beings at least have the capacity to understand this very central idea of production of giving back to nature so that nature through through altering the metabolism of nature we are able to win back i we are able to gain things back we are able to to produce things for our future use i always think about ancient religions when i think about this particular passage because nearly every major ancient religion has the concept of giving back to the earth uh, the concept of sacrificing something not satisfying your urges today taking a part of the food out and giving it to the gods as a, as a form of tribute is really founded in the idea that some part, some sacrifice has to be made in our current consumption in order for production to continue. And that central motif can be found in religions across the world, ancient as well as modern. Now humans eventually surpassed all other animals in intelligence. It isn't that humans became the, as we like to call it, the apex predator because we were the strongest or we were the fastest or we were the, you know, um, had the biggest teeth or, or, or we were the toughest or uh, any of those things really. We were none of those things in fact. But the reason why we were able to dominate over other animals is because we were the most intelligent. And by the way, what is true with respect to, um, you know, the competition between species, which species comes out on top, dominates the others, is in my opinion also true between the competition between civilizations, civilizations that develop the intellect and, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, create conditions for the stimulation of the intellect always uh, I think are able to surpass civilizations that constrain the intellect in a narrow circle. So Engels writes a race of apes far surpassed all other animals in intelligence and adaptability. Of course he's talking about human beings, homo sapiens as a uh, anthropologists like to say. The predatory economy led to a continued increase in the number of plants used for food and the consumption of more and more edible parts of food plants. Food became more and more varied as did also the substance entering the body with it. Substances that were the chemical premise for the transition to man. And one of the key substances that Engels of course is talking about is, the, is meat and protein. Um, Engels writes that a meat diet contained in an almost ready state the most essential ingredients required by the organism for its metabolism. By shortening the time required for digestion with all due respect to the vegetarians, man did not come into existence without a mean meat diet. This also led to cannibalism at some time or other, the forefathers of the Berliners the Veletabians or Welsians used to eat their parents as late as the 10th century. Ugh, that makes me a bit sick, but it is frankly true. Meat diet, Engels says, led to the harnessing of fire and the domestication of animals. Just as man learned to consume everything edible, he also learned to live in any climate. He spread over the whole of the habitable world. So fire, and cooking on top of fire was one of the key advances in humanity's evolution. Because what it meant was that you didn't have to, if you hunted and you had meat, you didn't have to eat the meat raw, which would take an awfully long time in your digestive system to go through your digestive system. Now, 
I mean, you could still eat meat raw. Some people like to eat their steaks extremely raw, you know. Um, but if you cook it more, then it is, in a certain sense, easier to digest. It is, in a certain sense, half digested. And by hunting animals, of course, ancient man cut out their skins and used those for shelter, for clothing, used caves for shelter, used skin for clothing. Engels continues the transition from the uniformly hot climate of the original home of man to colder regions where the year was divided into summer and winter created new requirements, shelter and clothing as protection against cold and damp, and hence new spheres of labor, new forms of activity which further and further separated man from the animal. Now clothes had to be made, now homes had to be built, shelters had to be built. Uh, clothes for different uh, people had to be of different sizes. Stitching had to be learned. All these new crafts, all the creation of new demands led to the creation of new forms of labor and to stimulating the mind. Now many people think that Marx and Engels are writers who would want us to live in absolute penury because they are pro-poor, so they must be pro-poverty. They are not in favor of the development of great luxuries, etc., etc. But this is not the case, as you can quite clearly see from here. In fact, they consider the growth of human demands to be a positive thing in the evolution of humanity. Because as human demands grow, so does the skill to match those or meet that demand. So does the ability of humanity to meet that demand. And with every growth in the skills and ability and the intellectual power of humanity, to meet those demands, you see the evolution of human, of the human animal, of, of its, uh, based upon its mind. So I, I, I don't think Marx and Engels were ever of the view that the development of ever finer, more refined kinds of things, more refined kinds of art or refined kinds of food or refined kinds of craft was a negative thing in any way, shape or form in the evolution of man. Next, Engels wants to talk about modern man with the beginning of agriculture. Agriculture, he says, was added to hunting and cattle raising. Then came spinning, weaving, metalworking, pottery and navigation. Along with trade and industry, art and science finally appeared. The first traces of modern man in Europe date back to the period of the Ice Age around 40,000 years ago. Specialized tools and remarkable works of art are evidence of a highly developed culture in this cold environment. So this is the last ice age that Engels is of course talking about and some of the ancient paintings that have been found in, uh, in Europe, um, uh, cave paintings are, some of them are 35,000 years old, some of them are 40,000 years old. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, there are even paintings that have been found that are far older than that even. So there is evidence now that Engels didn't have at it at the time that he wrote this essay that shows that mankind was living in these caves in the European continent and other parts of the world where there was ice everywhere uh, at a time where one would have imagined it would have been impossible for man to have survived those climates and yet man did. How was this possible? How did humanity survive the, these extreme climates if not without the development of clothing, shelter, fire, and so on. So tribes over time developed into nations and states. Law and politics arose and with them that fantastic reflection of human things in the human mind, religion. Here is a very interesting idea. The idea is the flip opposite of what we often conceive, uh, you know, with respect to Marxism, that Marxism is always hostile to religion. But here we see quite the converse that Marx and Engels consider the development of religion to be, uh, you know, an incredible stage in the development of thought of mankind, an incredible advance in the development of the thought of mankind. Because here was an entire theory of how for the first time, and then of course there are many, many theories that continue, but religion is for the first time a theory of the general principles of nature and of the world. It doesn't matter that this or that religion got the general principles right or wrong. The point is that man for the first time, humanity for the first time, is attempting to uh, grasp at general principles, general abstract principles that 
determine the way in which the world works. In the face of all these images, which appear in the first place to be products of the mind and seem to dominate human societies, the more modest productions of the working hand retreated into the background. All merit for the swift advance of civilization was ascribed to the mind, to the development and activity of the brain. So in the course of time, there emerged the idealistic world outlook. Wow, this is a fantastic passage that I love to read out and then to explore. Because what this means is that although humanity's mind and hand developed in correlation with each other, they developed in a certain sense, a mind developed by the work of the hand. And so everything that we developed, the civilization that we developed, we developed, you know, in, 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 in connection between the mind and the body. But once mankind reached a certain level with the development, let's say, of religion. These were pure ideas. These were ideas of such abstraction. They existed on their own that in front of the creation of things like religion, those things that mankind had created with their hands seemed to be almost uh, unimportant, insignificant. They paled in comparison to the products of pure of the mind of pure intellect of, of, of pure ideas so in that sense the link between the mind and the body and how each develops the other and how our mind itself is de so so dependent on the way in which we work and what we work at because we've forgotten that connection we also developed an entire philosophy which he calls idealism he doesn't mean by this religion but idealism in which ideas the mind plays a role in the development of civilization independent of matter, body, the hand, etc. That's really what he means. We'll explore this idea much you know, further when we look at uh, materialism uh, you know, in a later course. But for the moment, uh, let me just put this uh, in front of you uh, for you to think about. Engels continues that animals exert a lasting effect on their environment unintentionally and accidentally whereas man exerts an effect that is premeditated planned and directed towards definite preconceived ends and this is one of the fundamental differences between um, what animals do and what mankind does right the capacity for conscious planned action is proportional to the development of the nervous system wow so in other words it is the nervous system itself that gives us the ability to plan and to do undertake labor in a premeditated way. Now there are some animals, you must be thinking this, I'm thinking the same thing, there are some animals that are able to do tasks with preconceived ends. For example, chimpanzees are able to take long stalks of grass, put them into ant holes and then lick the ants off as food. We observe this quite commonly. That is a, definitely a form of a premeditated, you know, action to get that straw of grass for yet another end is an example of that. However, look at that in comparison to the planning that mankind undertakes, which is on a vast scale where we plan not just cities, we can plan countries, we can plan, you know, economies and so on and so forth. The greater the planning, Marx and Engels are suggesting, uh, the greater our ability to plan, the long-term planning that we, we undertake, the greater is the capacity for intellect. In other words, planning is always a good thing. <laughs> Anarchy is never good. And it, because it requires a lot more effort to plan, a lot more intellectual labor to plan. And that effort and that intellectual labor in turn develops our mind and our nervous system. Engels continues, in short, the animal merely uses its environment and brings about changes in it simply by its presence. Man, by his changes, makes it serve his ends, masters it. This is the final essential distinction between man and other animals. And once again, it is labor that brings about this distinction. Let us not, however, flatter ourselves over much on account of our human victories over nature, for each such victory, nature takes its revenge on us. I will just come to that concept in just a bit. But let me go back into our own history, uh, you know, and into our religion. 
we have a concept in Islam which is known in which we say that man is Ashraf al makhlukat of all the created uh, forms of life in the world we are the highest Ashraf means highest makhluk means comes from you know creation so we are the highest form of creation but this passage is very interesting because what it's what it's suggesting to us is that in a certain sense man or humanity is responsible for its own creation for its own development for its own evolution just as a child evolves by working harder by trying to ride that cycle or by trying to walk over and over again the child's brain evolves so humanity also evolves through its tussles with nature against nature to master nature to make sure that um, uh, you know we are able to control the great waters of the world the great floods of the world that we are able to control the rain we are able to control uh, you know um, agriculture and the growth of trees and plants and we're able to domesticate animals etc all of these things are attempts to master nature and Engels doesn't consider uh, Marx and Engels don't consider uh, the will to master or dominate nature to be necessarily a bad thing I'm being a bit Nietzscheite over here but but they do point out that at every step we are reminded that we by no means rule over nature like a conqueror over a foreign people like someone standing outside nature but that we with flesh blood and brain belong to nature and exist in its midst and that all our mastery of it consists in the fact that we have the advantage over all other creatures of being able to learn its laws and apply them correctly so that's our main advantage. We can never escape the laws of nature. We can never stand outside of nature. We can never dominate nature in the same way as, um, you know, a foreigner would dominate a colonized people or something. Because we're always going to be part of nature. But we can understand nature through science, through effort. And by understanding it, we can understand its laws. And by understanding the laws of nature, we can apply them to better our own lives. What about the social effects of our labor? Now we've talked about the effect of our labor on the thing, the object of our labor, whatever raw materials we're working on, we fashion them into, into a commodity or into a product or whatever. And in the process, we are ourselves changing our own selves. This is, by the way, a very Hegelian theme. If you know the master-slave dialectic in Hegel, you, you will see that this is very much a Hegelian idea, that the slave by creating civilization you know creates him or herself in much the same way mankind or humanity by creating civilization is in the simultaneously in the process of self-evolution but what about a third aspect what about the social effect of our labor Engels writes it required the labor of thousands of years for us to learn a little of how to calculate the more remote natural effects of our actions in the field of production. But it has been still more difficult in regard to the more remote social effects of these actions. In other words, it took us thousands of years to understand how our actions will impact nature. And it's taken us even longer to understand how our actions impact each other. The men who in the 17th and 18th centuries labored to create the steam engine had no idea that they were preparing the instrument which more than any other was to revolutionize social relations throughout the world. The, in other words, I'll put it to you in simpler language. People who are creating things like the steam engine or people who are creating things like DNA modification today or travel to Mars have no idea and can have no idea really how in, how in what an enormous way or, or let's say people who are developing artificial intelligence can only guess very wildly at how artificial intelligence, space travel and DNA reconstruction are going to impact not just space and our DNA uh, or you know <laughs> robots and their production but how it's going to impact social relations within humanity. 
Engels continues, especially in Europe by concentrating wealth in the hands of a minority and dispossessing the huge majority, this instrument was destined at first to give social and political domination to the bourgeoisie, but later to give rise to a class struggle between bourgeoisie and proletariat, which can end only in the overthrow of the bourgeoisie and the abolition of all class antagonisms. Now, James Watt, who invented the steam engine, could not have dreamt that he was not just going to create a steam engine, he was going to create an entirely new way of organizing society, which is going to result in its own contradictions. You know, the contradictions between capitalists, what he refers to as bourgeoisie, and workers on the other side, what he refer, will refer to as proletarians, and would result in this enormous dynamic that would be unleashed because of the creation of what? An engine. It starts a revolution in much the same way. Look at you and I talking today. I am talking to you and hopefully teaching you things about the world through social media. You've never met me. I've never met you. And yet, isn't social media also revolutionizing our lives? Even though I think Mark Zuckerberg or, you know, all the other creators of social media could never have estimated all the different ways or foreseen all the different ways in which social media would eventually end up changing our lives. Engels continues that uh, political economy really has been focused only on looking at the immediate results of our social production. He writes, existing modes of production have aimed merely at achieving the most immediately and directly useful effects of labor. The further consequences, which, which appear only later and become effective through gradual repetition and accumulation, were totally neglected, neglected, of course, by political economy. The individual capitalists who dominate production and exchange are able to concern themselves only with the most immediate useful effect of their actions. In other words, they're only looking at, well, I better get this produced in time, I better sell this, and I better make a profit off of this. But Engels continues, indeed, even this useful effect, in as much as it is a question of the usefulness of the article that is produced or exchange, retreats far into the background, and the sole incentive becomes a profit to be made on selling. This, of course, has been the aim of classical political economy, to understand this system of uh, commodity production and, 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 and profit maximization. He refers to, Engels refers to classical political economy as the social science of the capitalist class. It mainly only examines the social effects of human actions in the fields of production and exchange that are actually intended. In other words, I intended to create a profit. Did I manage to create a profit or not? I intended to create this many shoes or computers or whatever. Did I manage to create them? How expensive were they? How expensive weren't they, etc. These are really the subjects of economics. Political economy, of course, was the term that was used in the 19th century to talk about economics. The term economics came much later in 1920. Of course, it is an earlier term, but it was really in 1920 that the term economics uh, supplanted the term political economy. Uh, Engels continues, and then surprise is expressed that the more remote effects of actions directed to this end turn out to be quite different, are mostly quite the opposite in character, that the harmony of supply and demand is transformed into the very reverse opposite, as shown by the course of each 10 years industrial cycle. In other words, classical political economy really has not, its intention has not been to study capitalism as a larger system, but to study really, uh, you know, uh, the main questions, the intended outcome of those actions, whether they were able to accomplish. So Marx and Engels want to set themselves a new and different task. And that task is a critique of economics, or as they would put it, a critique of political economy. And they write, by long and often cruel experience, and by collecting and analyzing historical material, we are gradually learning to get a clear view of the indirect more remote social effects of our production activity and so are an afforded an opportunity to control and regulate these effects as well. Engel says this regulation however requires something more than mere knowledge. It requires a complete revolution in our hitherto existing mode of production and simultaneously a revolution in our whole contemporary social order. So in other words to understand capitalism in its entirety, we have to understand not just what is produced, how it's produced, how to maximize profit, which has really been the subject 
of economics as a whole, but we have to understand also all its unintended consequences. Its consequences in terms of the kinds of society we build, the relationships that we develop between working class people, capitalists, etc., the poverty that or inequality that uh, this uh, particular system may create, and perhaps extremely importantly, um, last but certainly not least, the impact that our constant production and our constant imperative to maximize profit has on the environment and on, on the climate and on in the world, you know, and the impact that it has on the world in which we live. These are going to be the subject of critical political economy or a criticism of political economy. But it's not enough just to criticize political economy and to understand the negative impact of this particular economic system, mode of production, that is capitalism. He says, in order for us to control, regulate, mitigate the unintended consequences of capitalism, we would have to change capitalism itself. So what have we learned from this wonderful essay? Well, first and foremost, we have learned that labor played a very important role in the evolution and development of mankind, of humanity. Without labor, our minds would never have developed. Without labor, our hands would never have developed their dexterous ability. Without labor, we would have never stimulated our intellect to understand new things and to master nature. But in the process of trying to understand nature and therefore, and mastering nature and therefore changing ourselves, not only have we changed ourselves, we evolved into a stage where the products of the mind began to pale uh, the products of the hand, purely of the hand. In other words, things like religion, abstract ideas like justice and religion, etc., general theories about the world began to look so phenomenal in comparison to things that we were creating with the hand that we made this sort of strange transition in our understanding about how we ourselves have evolved in the context of nature, that we forgot the role that matter itself plays, that interaction with matter, that the, the role of the hand has played, and how the mind and the hand have interacted in the development of the human ner ner nervous system. We forgot all of that, and we ended up with a, with a very strange view about how humanity evolves, which is what he refers to as philosophical idealism, which we'll explore later. But very briefly is the concept that ideas have no connection or bearing with the material world, uh, that it is the material world which is secondary and the ideas that are primary, etc. So this idealistic philosophy sort of is the outcome of our own social and uh, intellectual development. It, uh, it was, uh, in a certain sense, going to come about inevitably as the products of the mind began to, you know, completely overshadow the products of the hand. Finally, he says it took us thousands of years to understand uh, the unintended consequences of our actions. And it's taken us a thousand, thousand years to understand the social unintended consequences of our productive abilities and capacities and activities. But now that we have begun to try and examine what are the results of our, of our productive activity on our social relations, and not only have we begun to discover them, we want to regulate them. Now regulating the unintended consequences of our productive activity, he says, is going to require an entire transformation in the way in which we organized society. In other words, of course, he's talking about socialism, but we'll get there eventually. Hope you enjoyed that lecture. Hope to see you next time. Take care. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. All the best.